And so it just gives me the greatest of pleasure now to introduce Nike Sokolik uh, from the University of Berkeley, who is going to talk to us about real and virtual learning engagement in my team. Thank you very much. So first of all, I just I want to say thank you for those who lasted out the whole day. Um, I know uh, these long day conferences are challenging, but they're also really exciting. I got to see all kinds of great things today from Shakespeare to grammar games to um, just uh, collaborative learning and writing. So um, I'm really happy that I got a chance uh, to be here the whole day and see lots of good talks. So, um, I love conferences this size. Um, I also want to thank the organizers. Um, so I've run across a lot of these headlines recently. Um, they've popped up in my Facebook and um, on my news feed and things. So I actually want to thank the organizers for apparently making me smarter and healthier uh, today uh, by inviting me to come to Hong Kong um, and to this beautiful, uh, albeit slightly rainy place uh, to uh, give this talk. Uh, so, uh, as Nigel mentioned, I'm from UC Berkeley. Has anyone visited my campus? Okay, so a few people. I figured we would have a few in the audience. Um, so there across the water you see there, San Francisco Bay and San Francisco on the other side. And that's the view we have from our campus. And um, on this campus, I direct the writing program. Um, we're, it's actually the writing programs. We are a collaboration of creative writing, academic writing, public speaking. Uh, in the summer, we have a visiting program for ESL during the year. We do not have ESL. Um, for better or worse, our administration believes if you're good enough to get into Berkeley, um, obviously your English is good enough. Uh, some take issue uh, with that idea, but uh, I think uh, there's something to be said for that. Um, so the, just to give you some context for the data and the information I'm going to be talking about, um, as an administrator, I actually gave up most classroom teaching about four years ago, except for an occasional graduate class. And, but I didn't want to completely give up teaching. And in about 2013, I was approached to teach a MOOC. Uh, and I actually, uh, they were very excited when they came to me. So we built this great studio, and you could go in there and you can give your lectures, and it'll be videoed, and it's, it's just going to be fabulous. We spent millions of dollars on this studio. I said, lectures? I teach writing. I don't lecture. Like, what would I say um, in a lecture? And no one has ever learned to write by watching someone's face move while sound comes out. You learn to write by writing um, and by talking a bit about writing. We don't learn to write by listening to a lecture about writing. Um, and so I said, no, I am not interested in teaching a MOOC. So they came back about a year later and said, OK, do it your way. I said, all right. Um, and so there are, you will not see in my MOOCs any talking head videos of me behind a green screen, um, you know, with pictures of Paris behind me or something. Um, but, uh, so I, I took on a project to teach writing um, for students whose first language was other than English. Uh, and it was supported in part by the US Department of State. Uh, and they did a lot of really interesting things to help make it a success. It felt short of giving me any money, but they did a lot of interesting things. Um, so, for those who may not know about MOOCs or what this word is, um, so the first word is massive, and in fact, one uh, section of the writing course that I'm going to be, one of which I'm going to be talking about, at one point enrolled 120,000 students for a single session. Um, it now, because there's a lot more competition out there, it now enrolls more like 20 to 30,000, a mere 20 to 30,000. Um, open, uh, it used to mean freely available, although if you know about MOOCs, you'll find increasingly there's a pay structure 
um, for certificates and even to get your work <coughs> assessed. Um, you'll have to pay some uh, amount of money. It's online, of course, and it's the important part is that it's a course. Um, it's not just a few lessons, it's actually conceived as an entire course of some kind with a topic and assessment and readings and writing and so forth. Uh, so the other, of course, thing we often talk about in MOOCs is completion rates. And I'm going to say a word in a minute about why I don't think it's that important. Um, but just from these three studies alone, you see how slippery this whole concept of completion rate is in a MOOC. Uh, so there was this, the most recent study, one by Katie Jordan, that was about a year ago, um, said that the completion rate is about 15%, but she looked just at US and European MOOCs. She didn't look kind of beyond those borders. Udacity's founders said that their completion rate is about 8%. Um, University of Pennsylvania just did a study and they're finding more like 4%. Uh, so I'm going to talk about completion rate um, in my courses. But I am going to say one of the reasons I think it's not as important um, as it's sometimes made out to be is one, at least for my students, um, these are voluntary courses. They're not receiving credit. Um, you know, they're not being compelled to attend. Um, and I call it the um, kind of the health club syndrome a little bit of signing up for MOOCs. I mean, I know I've done it, probably lots of people have done it, right? I'm going to sign up for the health club. I'm going to go every day. I'm going to get so healthy. I'm going to lose so much weight. It's going to be amazing. Week one, yes, did it. Week two, uh, I've got to work late on Tuesday, but I'll do it four days this week. Week three, wow, okay, birthday party, my kid's sick, got to work late, um, and so it goes. People's lives don't change because they've signed up for a MOOC. They have the same constraints on their time. Also, I discovered the first time I taught a MOOC that about, I think it was close to 25% of the people that signed up were English teachers. Um, not looking to improve their English, looking to see what is this thing that she's doing online here. So there was never any intention uh, for them to go through and complete the course of study. Um, okay, so in here, so that's just some background. Here's what I'm going to be talking about. In spite of maybe it's not such a big deal that you know we have low completion rates, of course everybody that designs a MOOC or any kind of class wants students to be engaged, to keep coming back, um, to like the material. And so we find though in our face-to-face -face writing classes and in online writing classes that students can become really quickly disengaged with the material. And anybody in here who's taught writing probably knows this to be the case. Um, so what are the causes of this disengagement? Um, how does the online environment exacerbate that problem? So if we see it in the face-to-face -face classes, how does it get worse um, when we take it online? Um, how can we restructure then any online learning to kind of take advantage of what we know about engagement? And then how can we take that back to our face-to-face -face classrooms? Um, I'm going to start with just a few student opinions. And I know you all are quite capable of reading, and these are really nice screens, but I'm still gonna read it out because I think it requires like a good California inflection for some of these quotations. Mm -hmm. I despise essays at this point. Even though I always get high marks on them, I question everything when I write, everything I write when doing an essay, wondering if it makes any sense I can't stand reading over it when revising it multiple times. By the time I turn it in, I think the paper is complete garbage. The worst class I ever took was philosophy because it was all long and short essays. Um, and I think we see here in this quotation one of the reasons or rationale for disengagement is that, and I see this in my students when I was teaching, students in the revision process really do get tired of looking at the same piece of writing over and over as we tell them, no, it needs to be revised, it needs to be edited. And I know, um, you know, having written journal articles and book chapters and books, I actually don't like hearing that from my editor either. It's like, oh, I can't look at this one more time. 
The second one, one thing I never understood back when I first started college was that my English teachers always said that we needed to go through all the steps of writing when composing an essay. Brainstorming, rough draft, final draft. Our final for the class was a timed essay where we had two hours to write an entire essay from scratch. Um, and I think this uh, actually underscores a problem that I see in a lot of writing classes where our stated goals often don't match our assessment techniques. We love process writing. Oh yeah, here, write an essay in two hours. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that hating essays isn't always because someone is having trouble with them. I do well on all of mine, but I loathe the whole process, and I find it a huge waste of time compared to my assignments in other classes. This kind of says it all there. Um, I hate essays that even the profs know are full of BS. It's like they are asking us to write about the color blue, but you have to use 10 pages. Um, so topics that don't uh, entice topics that are seen as irrelevant to students. I don't actually know anyone who's assigned a 10-page paper on the color blue, uh, but I understand the student's point. And finally, my favorite, it's short and to the point, essays are straight up the reason I'm a math major. <laughs> so the problems, students are frequently disengaged um, with writing challenges. I want to take a step back. Um, engagement is one of those words that's been kind of bandied about since the 1980s. Uh, and couple, see a couple of um, definitions here, one that goes back about 20 years, which I actually put up here because I find it to underscore some of the problems with the discussion of engagement. It basically, the fundamental idea underlying engagement theory is that students must be meaningfully engaged in learning activities through interaction with others while, and with while tasks. In other words, in order for students to be engaged, they must be doing engaging things. Okay. Um, not a lot of content there. And that's a lot of the discussion of engagement. And this happens at political levels, too. I mean, um, every once in a while, you'll see um, an article in the newspaper or in a magazine that says, you know, students these days are not engaged. And the politicians or the band or the parents come out and say, I know how to fix it. We need to make classes more engaging. Uh, but the second one, I think, gets more to the point. Engagement is a multi-dimensional construct that reflects both observable external factors as well as less observable internal <laughs> factors. Um, and so as I was reading lots of different articles, it, it occurred to me it kind of boiled down to three things. And I just for ease of memory called it the ABCs of engagement. There's the affective aspect of engagement, the sense of belonging. I'm where I should be. This class is for me. Um, I'm with people that I feel a sense of shared values or shared goals with. Um, I have a positive attitude towards learning. And uh, it's also behavioral, effort, participation, that student who's actually doing things in class. And then finally, the cognitive part of it, which is um, the self-regulation, goal setting, you know, the ability to make a plan to continue to learn. Um, so I kind of put this together, my Photoshop skills are so-so, uh, but uh, as a kind of cycle of engagement, starting with planning, um, which is this, you know, goal setting, uh, time management, choosing contexts. Um, I often ask my students, where do you like to write? Um, you know, do you write best in the library or at home sitting on your bed or at a desk? Um, then it goes to monitoring, checking your motivation. Am I really ready for this? Um, how do I feel about things? Um, goes around the circle to management, regulating your feelings, um, your time use, um, you know, are things working out? And then finally reflection, uh, the generation of your reactions, you know, how, how am I doing? How am I feeling about how I'm doing? And of course, this isn't strictly circular. At any point, um, learners can stop and go back. I mean, you could get to the second one, check your motivation, say, you know what? Like, the way I'm approaching this is not working. I need to go back and make some new plans for how I'm going to tackle this class because I really don't feel like what I'm doing is effective. Um, 
I believe the slides are going to be available after this talk, so I've got a, various slides of um, references throughout, so I know some people like to take photos, so that's fine, um, but they'll also be available online. But there's loads and loads of studies, entire websites. In fact, the Nat National Center for School Engagement, schoolengagement.org, that just talks about nothing but uh, student engagement. So our first question, what are the causes? Um, so one of the causes that we often find are that students come in with weak skills. And it's really easy to not enjoy writing if you don't know how to do it very well. Um, right? You can't, uh, your grammar is weak, or for most of our students who are struggling um, with writing, it's often vocabulary. Um, they don't have the words to say what it is they want to say. Uh, they don't see the relevance of the topics that they're assigned. Um, they feel like they have to write in final draft form the first time out. Um, and then, uh, they, like that first quotation, they hate the revision process when they're told that first time out is not good enough. Um, and I find with these students, they often, and they, when questioned, they'll even say this, um, they imagine that a skilled writer really sits down, says, okay, I'm gonna write this, writes it out, sends it off to a publisher, and it's done. Uh, perfect, first time out. Um, and they really um, don't see the hard work sometimes. And that's because I think we as writing teachers sometimes make that hard work invisible ourselves. We don't model the process of revision and editing for students. I um, once took, I got a chapter back from an editor once that was just a horror. I mean, it, it was so covered in red marks and things crossed out and what do you mean here, question mark, exclamation point. Um, and I took it and actually showed students. I said, this is what happens you know, when I write. This is what my editor does. And they're shocked. <laughs> what? I mean, I think they probably thought, why did they hire you to teach us? <laughs> um, <laughs> but at least they could see that, you know, people who write don't hit it out of the park every time. Um, they believe that writing and its assessment are both subjective. Um, and you, uh, we hear that a lot from both engineers and math students who very wrongly believe that their own fields have very clear well, single answers to questions. And we know that's not the case, uh, but often the new student going into math will say they're going into math because they, they want to be in a field that has answers. Uh, wait till they get to theoretical. And when they receive bad feedback, or no feedback, or late feedback, um, it becomes a very demotivating part of the cycle, and they don't see the point. So what happens when you take all of that into the online environment? So I'm still affected by all those things, but I'm saying it adds one more thing. Um, it relies so heavily on self-regulated learning um, that students who don't have those skills already very <coughs> quickly fall off the map. Um, they don't know how to plan their time. Um, they just kind of think time is magically going to appear in their schedule and they're going to be able to get all this writing done and reading done, and it doesn't happen until they leave the course. Um, so this is a kind of simplified version um, of uh, material from Reshley and Christensen on a model of engagement. And they looked at all these different factors. And what you see on the left is the different contexts that affect a student's engagement. So um, it could be their support, say, from their family or friends. Um, it could be resources that are available, how many books are in the home. We know that's always been um, a really significant factor uh, in of educational success, um, their peers, whether they have peers that have shared goals, um, attendance, you know, whether they're showing up, um, and then whether their classes are offering participation opportunities and further support. And then as you go across, I'm not going to read out the entire chart, um, you see that, uh, you know, if these things are in place, then you end up with a sense of belonging, which then uh, ends up to, you know, higher success um, in their related fields and scores, and then improved educational futures, their driving Mercedes, you know, all of that because that, that's 
left column was satisfied. Um, and it paints a very rosy picture of like what, when things go right, this is what can happen. Um, but I sort of took that model and said, okay, but what about when things don't go right? Um, what happens when you don't have support at home for learning? Um, when we see this in our face-to-face -face classes, especially students who have families that um, they have to attend to, whether it's um, elderly parents or children, um, you know, and uh, things kind of tear them away uh, from their uh, schooling, um, or lack of resources, um, not enough funds to buy books or materials or laptops. Uh, and in the online situation, little or no peer contact. Um, if you, how many have taken a MOOC before? Anybody here has taken them? So I'm going to guess. I mean, I've taken them too. Um, I can't name one other person that was in that MOOC with me. Not one. I, I can still name some some of my classmates from classes 20 years ago, but I can't in a vast class that I've taken, name another student. And there's various reasons for that, but it does add to this sense of disconnectedness um, online. There's the material, there's the computer, there's a bunch of people, I don't really know them. I don't feel a sense of responsibility towards them. Uh, whether I show up or not has no effect on them. Whereas in a face-to-face -face class, especially if it's a small class, um, not showing up can have an enormous effect. Uh, I know uh, way back when, when I took Latin, took some advanced Latin class, there were only two of us in the class. Believe me, if one of us didn't show up, it had a big impact on the other one. Uh, so, uh, going across the chart then, you see that it leads to sort of login and frequency. Nobody cares if I show up, why should I bother to log in? Uh, and limited participation, uh, tasks then go incomplete, and again, kind of tails off with the student not finishing the course. Uh, and then I kind of take it to its far extreme over here, you know, you're not gonna get a job, and you know, your dog's gonna run away, all kinds of horrible things are gonna happen to you if you don't uh, connect with your online classes. Um, so what can we do to structure things? And this is kind of where the research came in. So I've been looking at different variables um, that are involved um, in these charts and things I just showed you, and looking at what kind, which variables can we manipulate in some way to see if they really make an effect. And so um, I looked at two variables in this kind of pilot part of the study. Um, one is, I, that I looked at is a sense of belonging. I originally called it inclusion, but inclusion in many contexts has come to mean something else, which has to do uh, with the inclusion of differently abled um, students. So it's not really what it's about. So I say inclusion here, but in later parts of this, I'll say belonging, which is more of uh, what I worked with. So, and I'll talk about how this was operationalized in a minute. And then um, goal setting, so that idea of planning one's learning. Um, and so it was two courses that I looked at, um, College Writing 2.2x, Academic and Business Writing. Um, this course actually is gonna begin again July 1st. Um, if anybody's interested in signing up and looking around to see what it is I do, be one of the many teachers there. Uh, and then uh, 15X, which is English for Journalists. Um, this was a course that was developed under the auspices of the U.S. Department of State uh, for journalists. Um, it focused on ethical journalism um, for journalists working primarily in the Balkans. Um, and, but it's, it's now open to anyone uh, globally. Uh, so when we think about online engagement, there's lots of ways that it's uh, measured in kind of the big data sense. Um, the number of items, kind of assessed items that are completed, the number of pages viewed, the number of videos that might be watched and how much of them are watched. Uh, edX, um, which is the platform that I work on, um, they once told me that most students only watch the first 30 seconds of a video. So to pack as much information in that first 30 seconds as possible, like, well, that's an interesting task. Uh, uh, discussion forum engagement and then completion rate. 
I'm only going to be looking at the first and the final there. Um, one of the reasons I don't think number of pages viewed is necessarily a good measure. Um, I don't know about you, but I have to do like this online ethics training for my university like every year. And then I have to do cybersecurity every year. And so all these things, they're the same training every year. We don't get marked on whether we pass the assessment, just on how much time we spend. So, Edward, the state government requires us to spend two hours on our ethics course. So you can imagine what happens. Very ethical behavior. <laughs> Click, get a cup of tea. Click, go put the laundry in. Um, so I don't think pages view really tells us that it's pages read or pages engaged with. Uh, similarly, for a number of videos watched, um, you could turn a video on, walk away, turn a video on, bring it to another <laughs> screen and play a couple of rounds of Scrabble. Um, there's, you know, we don't know necessarily that videos are being engaged with. Discussion, discussion forum engagement, I think, could be a better measure, but um, I talked about this in my workshop yesterday, and I won't go into it again, but for a lot of reasons, discussion forums are a mess, and um, there's not an easy way uh, to deal with discussion forum participation, uh, at least not on the edX platform. So we'll look at the first of two. So some numbers. So 2017, um, so we've got two types of students in the classes, um, auditing students, the ones that don't pay, and then paid students. Um, and you'll see just from these numbers, very few students elect to pay for these courses. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it gets you a certificate. Um, and you know, and I know certificates are kind of big business, and friend and I often talk about just going into the certificate business, like how much money we can make, uh, because a lot of people love those certificates, but really, for $50, you get a certificate. Uh, and uh, so then in 2018, that star means that this group of students got an inclusion statement. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Then 2016, the English for Journalists. Um, again, you see very few actually paid. Uh, more paid in 2018, but still the auditors um, you know, really outstrip uh, the, the paid students. So here are the passing rates, and this is 50% completion rate or more. Uh, the little V by there means those are the paid students. So in 2017, the overall passing rate was 10% for the class. 65% of you paid. 2018, it wasn't such a big difference, 10 to 19%. Uh, and then for the other courses, it, you see where it goes, 17 to 64, 9 to 57. So it seems like we have the answer. Just make everybody pay. They'll pass at a much higher rate. Uh, but it's a really silly and not very interesting answer, actually, um, because as you see from the numbers in the previous week, most people don't pay. So for those of you that pay, you know they're already fairly highly motivated. They've decided to pay to commit to it. So I'm much more interested in those students that didn't pay, what keeps those in the class? Um, you know, what might make them want to stay? So for that first group, um, they were given a message of belonging. Um, as students uh, logged into the course for the first time, they were randomly assigned into groups. Um, group one just got the regular kind of messages through the uh, system, which includes a weekly email saying, you know, rah, rah, you know, keep going, we're doing great. Um, but the second group at the beginning gets this message, and these screens are so nice, you might actually be able to read it, but I've put it on another screen coming up with, in bigger font so you can see it. Um, and, you know, with this photograph of all these different people from different backgrounds, um, and uh, here it is. You know, are you a homeschool teenager wondering if you could handle a course with complex readings? Perhaps you're a senior adult who hasn't been in the classroom in years and are concerned that you can't keep up. Maybe English isn't your native language. And I mentioned this because even though the class was designed for non-native speakers, lots of native speakers sign up for the class. 
um, and you're worried that your vocabulary isn't strong enough to handle the reading. Maybe you have a disability that keeps you away from traditional classrooms, but you're still eager to learn. We want to reassure everyone that you belong here. Books are a great place to further or renew your love of learning. <coughs> I'm the only one like this. You're going to be delighted to find others who share a lot in common with you. Take a moment and either privately or in the discussion below, express any doubts or fears you have about completing the course. We're here to help, and more than that, you're all here to help each other. And have fun, which is my tagline. It's very helpful. Um, so here's what happened after these students got these messages. And they also got additional emails during the course um, that said, you know, keep going, you're doing great, and you know, um, let us know if you have issues. So um, you see the numbers there, 3,829 audit students received the belonging messages of that 394 passed, 10% passing rate compared to an overall 10% passing rate. And the same thing happens with the audit students who didn't receive the additional messages, no numbers change, not even by 1% either direction. Um, exactly the same passing rate happened, whether they got the extra messages that they belong, rah, rah, we, you know, we love you, we want you here, didn't matter. In the second course, um, we asked students at the beginning of the course to write down their goals. You know, why are you here? What are your goals for taking this class? Um, it was voluntary, so we didn't get a large amount of participation. Um, but of those who participated, 24% um, passed the course compared to 9% of the overall population. And even it, among the paid students, who we know are already fairly highly motivated, of the ones who passed, 75% of them passed uh, of the ones who got the goal statement compared to 57%. And I just added here some of their goals. They were very broad, uh, but uh, they you know, definitely um, put some thought into it. And some of them were more elaborate than this, but they didn't fit on the screen. So, uh, but just some example goals of why they joined the course. So, um, I started looking a little more deeply into this idea of goal setting um, in education. And um, there's this article, Student Ind Indicators of Engagement Goal Setting. Goal setting in general has a higher impact on motivation than praise or encouragement from an external source. Um, so as much as we might like to praise, encourage, uh, etc., cetera, uh, goals are directive. But they kind of help focus uh, the mind. They're energizing. Students kind of know what it is they want to do, um, and they've got kind of a plan in their frontal cortex. Um, they affect persistence. Um, it's shown that you know if you have a goal, you're more likely to follow through. Um, and they lead to action. Um, you know, if you have a goal, sometimes you also have an action plan for how you're going to achieve that goal. Uh, so, some conclusions from this. Belonging statements had no effect, right, on the completion rate. Um, and, but goal setting was highly associated with increasing the completion rate at this point. Um, but I want to kind of warn here um, that I am not implying any kind of cause and effect. Um, in fact, it may very well be that the students, because it was voluntary, the students who chose to write out their goals were already the most motivated <coughs> ones. But it still doesn't explain the fairly large difference in the percentage of completion rate among those who set goals and those who didn't. Um, and so here's my thought, and in the discussion part of this, which is going to come up soon, um, I'd love to hear any other ideas, because this is my kind of interpretation here, um, is that belonging statements um, may not work the way we thought they might, um, because they're very top-down. 
It's the instructor who's deciding on these statements. It's the instructor um, who is kind of driving the bus in a way. Uh, and um, we also don't know, you know, just like my ethics online ethics course I have to take, don't actually know that they read those things. Even though we sent them out, we posted them, they're in the course, there's no guarantee, we have no idea how many actually read those belonging statements and took them to heart. Um, in the discussion area after the belonging statement, I don't think there was much um, that was said, actually, um, because we gave students the option to do it privately and not publicly post their fears and insecurities, which most students don't jump at the opportunity to discuss their fears and insecurities publicly with 120,000 students. Um, the flip side of that is that goals are initiated by the student, um, and that they require at least a modicum of engagement um, with the course and with the materials and with sitting and saying, why am I signing up for this course? What is it that um, made me sit down and sign up for this course, and why do I want to do it? Um, for future research, um, so we'll go back to those various cells in those tables and see what other uh, things we can manipulate um, and see if it affects um, the engagement and completion rate as well. Um, like I said, we have a course starting July 1st, um, so in the discussion time, if anybody's got any ideas, I need to sit down and really look at it and see what it is we want to do next. Oh, no, that didn't translate well, but um, so how, how can we use what we learned from online instruction to take back to our face-to-face -face classes? Um, and I think it you know, should be fairly obvious from what I've mentioned. Um, you know, it starts by examining the reasons that students are becoming disengaged in the first place. Um, and remedy those root causes. You know, is there a mismatch between our stated goals and the assignments we're giving? Um, and I see this happen a lot in classes. <laughs> I do uh, training of teaching assistants, and man, they know all the right stuff about teaching. They've read all the right stuff, they know all the right stuff, they can articulate the right stuff, and I go and observe them, and it's like I've stepped back to 1935 and watching them lecture about Moby Dick, um, and then say, go write about it. Uh, I think also we need to look at the balance between top-down encouragement um, from instructors encouraging students to be their own to, um, to be their own motivators through goal setting, um, and we can definitely do goal setting activities. Uh, when I was teaching beginning writing, uh, one of the things I would have them do is not just goal setting but also scheduling, uh, because first-year writers in particular but maybe all writers, um, have a really overly optimistic view of the amount of time they have in the day, um, and they would forget to schedule things like, you know, take a shower, eat lunch, um, walk in between classes and the dormitory. All of these things take time, and when they'd sit down and block out all the things they had to do and how much time it took, they're often surprised how little is left, and these, like, imagining these six hours, well, I'm just going to write, you know, the paper in six hours, um, and this is why students stay up all night. Um, and then incorporate goal setting into the writing process. Um, if our program, a lot of our instructors do something called a writer's memo. Um, when a student turns in uh, an assignment, a written assignment of some sort, they have to include with it a top sheet um, that says, what were your goals in this assignment? What was it you were really working on? Uh, what do you think you did well? And what do you still need to work on more? Um, and this helps students kind of maintain their focus um, in goal setting in the whole process. So here's the new, um, that student that was complaining about, you know, having to do drafting, revision, editing, and then publishing or submitting. Um, I just recommend slipping goal setting in there um, at the top of the list. And again, with this writing process, you know, there's no presumption that it's linear or serial. Um, any of us who write know that we snip in at different levels and go back and redo things. Um, so here's a, oh, like five minutes, right? Okay. Um, 
So one of my favorite um, kind of experts on pedagogy and all things pedagogy, uh, not just language, um, is Stephen Brookfield. And um, if you haven't read his things, I highly recommend this particular reading, in fact, um, called Through the Lens of Learning. I assign it to every graduate student before they even arrive in my class. Um, but one of the things he says here is an evaluator of my students' learning, I must be careful to remember that what I might judge to be a minuscule, insignificant amount of progress by a student, or even a total lack of movement, may be perceived by that person as a major learning event. Subjective assessments of meaning of learning to learners may be very different from the objective assessments made by external evaluators. I need to find a way of introducing self-evaluation methods so that students can document in their own terms how and what they've learned. And um, this kind of ties in with the idea of engagement in writing. Um, we need to give students more agency in telling us what it is they're learning, how they're learning it, and what they still need to learn. Um, I think in spite of like, all of our kind of wonderful pedagogical ideas, in the end we still up assessing products. Uh, and part of it is of necessity, you know, we all have to jump through certain hoops in our jobs and students have to achieve um, certain levels. But um, I really do think that by incorporating some simple things like goal setting, um, reflective practices, <coughs> students kind of take more agency uh, in the whole process. And more references, 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 references. Um, and thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Megan, for uh, your talk. We've got some time for questions, if anyone has any. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, a lot of what you uh, a lot of what you discuss actually mirrors our experience in delivering MOOCs. Uh, we, we talked a little bit over lunch that uh, we. Uh, delivered some books on edX as well. And uh, your ideas about disengagement and, and how that has an impact, I think is very interesting. And also goal setting. We did something similar. And we called it uh, expectations. So we had, had students define their expectations in the book first before we began. the camp. But something that you might want to look at uh, is um, the analytics or the, the data that is involved in the MOOCs. And, uh, I think engagement in discussion forums and videos is also important as well. Right? Uh, and the universe, our university has produced uh, something called BizMOOCs, and, and it's open, you can take a look at it. Oh. I would really recommend look, looking at it, where they visualize this on edX platform. And it visualizes engagement, uh, both with the videos and in discussion forums, as well as other things. And uh, for example, you can take a look at um, their discussion forum participation, the frequency, and whether or not it's tied to the grades. Okay. And you can also take a look at the videos and how if they fast forward, rewind, pause at different parts in the video, right? And that shows a different type of engagement as well. Oh, this sounds really, uh, yeah. It's, it's very useful for learning analytics and, and, and looking at engagement. Uh, Another part of research is social network analysis and looking at how students connect to each other within the discussion forums. And uh, it's a work in progress that I'm doing right now. One of the initial findings that I'm finding is you start to find that there's different types of participants in a MOOC. You'll have those who are lurkers, they just click and then there's a lot, and that's the majority. You also have on the other end, the other spectrum, um, uh, people who are there to help, and they actually change the learning environment. And they're the ones who are connecting the most, but they're, they're low frequency, they're very few of them. You have the other participants who do the tasks in a MOOC, right? But then they leave, and that's it. Right. Right. So I, I think a lot of this has a lot to do with what you're talking about with engagement, and how can we make use of this data in order to create more opportunities to encourage that engagement. I think uh, goal setting is a good way. Uh, yeah, um, one of the things you said was interesting, because um, I have looked at discussion forums a lot, and um, 
I have a lot of issues with the structure of the MX discussion forum. We'll just put it out there, right there. But, but um, a couple things that um, I, I'm doing some collaborative work um, with colleagues at University of Adelaide in Australia, because um, we're going to be combining some data and looking at things in different contexts. And two things that we've discovered in looking at some of the analytics, because um, that other end person, they often shut down the discussions. Um, I, I call them the pontificators. Um, you know, it, people are kind of, there's a little bit of back and forth, oh, here's what I think, here's what I think, and then five paragraphs of, you know, here's everything I thought about it, and the discussion ends right there. That, I mean, that happens in classes too, right? We've all had the pontificators in our classes. But the most interesting thing that I have found in looking at it is if I participate. The minute I answer or come in and participate in a discussion, it ends. It, um, and other colleagues of mine have noticed the same thing in MOOCs. Um, that somehow having kind of the voice of authority start to participate in one of the discussions is kind of like, oh, the person with the answers just said this, discussion over. Like, we don't have anything more to say. So I'm actually, um, and it may be something I try to manipulate in the future um, and look at as another variable, is my own participation and how that's affecting engagement or lack of engagement. Um, because it, it's, I mean, it was something completely contrary to what I would have thought. I would have thought, oh, you know, hey, I'm gonna, you know, be one of the gang. I'm gonna go in and talk and participate and, you know, answer their questions. And it had exactly the opposite effect. It's a time about, I do have a question, so the time sure. about together. And have you thought about embedding as this, the gold <laughs> that sort of thing we're talking about, into the rubrics with, when they're getting assessed? So they're reminded of this. Yeah, um, I think actually um, I was just looking at the course that's going to open July 1st and I think I'm going to redo goal setting again but in a different way. So looking at um, rubrics and also looking at maybe, I mean I don't want to make it compulsory um, but making it a little more forward so that more students participate in it and see you know, if that washes out the effect or if it enhances the effect. Later on, I started dropping off. Uh, the first reason is I started to realize that actually the content is not really hard. But I think that they have similar courses in some universities, but then they try to deal with them, so it's too easy for me. So I want to learn something more advanced that I cannot find it. And the second thing is I don't really trust the assessment. Because in ethics, it's, it's very easy. You just If you don't pass the test, then you can do it again. And then you know all the answers. So right. that's why anyway you will get the correct answer and you can pass it. And then in Coursera, it would be like someone else like your peer will give you some feedback in your writing, and then I don't really trust their feedback. It's like they just click on yes, no, yes, no. But then I think that because they want to pass it, because they have to give me feedback and they have to give me feedback in order to pass it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. Um I actually gave a talk once called How Do You Grade All Those Essays? Because that was the question I always got about teaching a writing MOOC. Um, but it is one of the, I mean, for better or worse, um, one of the features of doing kind of open-ended things in MOOCs is that you have to have peer assessment. Um, there's no, I mean, I actually been relying more on self-assessment lately, um, but uh, there's no way for an instructor or even, you know, I mean, I have a whole team of people and we couldn't, assess that many essays, um, just not physically possible. So um, so you rely on peers who do sometimes a great job and sometimes a really sketchy job. Um, you know, or they, like you said, they just want to get it done so that they can get their scores. Uh, we um, have found there are some ways to improve the peer review process and we've worked on those. Uh, one of the things, however, I will say that I was a big failure, and I don't know if you tried it, 
Um, edX, for example, has a training uh, system that you can put into place to train students how to be good peer reviewers. I did that the first time that I used it. It was such a failure. Students were so burned out from the training part. I mean, it's sort of like, they did all the work with the training, like, oh, and now we have to even read more essays? I mean, it was like the worst job ever. So uh, it's like, I gave that up after the first time. It's like, we can't do that. But there are ways, I think, of art. I have a very detailed rubric um, that requires commentary, and we ask students to flag, because we were finding some students would just go and like copy stuff from Wikipedia, like random things, and paste it to the comment boxes. You know, like, why is this? description of a salamander, you know, <laughs> let's, you know, um, and, but we started flagging those and, you know, then we could move those into somebody else's box to be read, but it, it you know, the, the peer thing, especially when you have this kind of vast public, as opposed to a group of students who are responsible to you and to each other, is very difficult. Yeah? Yeah, I think if you stick to the theme of goal setting, and have trained them to do the assessments. I mean, the failure, I can see why they, we did it as well. Uh, but if you make that part of their learning goal and make it clear that if you're learning the competency, you're learning the skills, and it's not the final product that matters, and then make that part of the training process, and that's part of the learning activity. Yeah, and some students really see that. We see that in the evaluations. They're like, oh, you know, actually reading and commenting on other people's papers has really taught me a lot about writing. Um, you know, more than just sitting and writing some things myself. Um, and so if you can get students to that point where they see that, and we also, you know, try to guilt trip a little by, you know, give, you know, give the kind of comments you want to get. You know, if you want good comments, you have to give good comments. You can't just phone it in, copy stuff from Wikipedia or whatever, and then expect people to take your writing seriously. Um, it just doesn't work that way. But, uh, but it is, you know, it is the, the tough, well, um, but you know, if you want to do open-ended things, um, like I said, I turn more to self-assessment and again with really articulated rubrics um, and things. And um, actually, I don't see a lot of difference and I think that's one of the things we'll probably be looking at in the future is kind of comparing self-assessed versus the um, peer assessed and seeing, you know, what, what those outcomes look like. I think we're probably any other questions that anyone has for Maggie? In which case, it's my great pleasure to thank Maggie for quite